Welcome. Um, glad to see you all here. We're very pleased to um, have this lecture to go along with our exhibit here tonight and uh, to have Beth Canal, not Beth Duggar, Beth Canal, um, to speak to us about our distinguished guests. Um, doing, this is a joint program of the St. Johnsbury Historical Society and the Athenaeum. And um, it seems um, appropriate that we do these things together because we both have such a long history in this community and um, it's, it's a joy to have these kinds of collaborations. I wanna thank um, the people who helped do the research and put this exhibit together, a little group of, of people who worked on this together, had a good time doing it. I did a little bit, a small amount compared to Shara McCaffrey, the assistant librarian here and president of the Historical Society. Elaine Garrison helped a great deal. Bob Jolly in the back there, who most of you know, um, who is also, <laughs> you got a clap, that's, that's great. <laughs> a fan club here. Um, Bob is the exhibits coordinator here at the Athenaeum and really does a fabulous job of making, making up these beautiful, beautiful exhibits out of a lot of ideas that, that, that come to him. So we really appreciate his eye for graphic design. And Beth Canal, of course, who um, came to us all excited with this excited idea and did a lot of research on the project and um, also developed a wonderful blog that uh, you can get to from our website. There's a link right on our website and it's um, beautifully done. It has a lot more information as well. Beth, I think, most of you may know she's a partner with Dave Cannell in um, Kingdom Books. She's a poet, she's an author, she's a writer, she's a historian, and um, we're very pleased to have her be our speaker tonight. Thank you. Please welcome Beth Cannell. Thank you very much. I'm gonna tap Lisa in a moment to take out handouts to you all because I'm going to be saying now on your next page I want to show you how you can use these handouts to get the most out of this exhibit and to keep thinking about who came here and why welcome Joan um, I tend to be uh, a history nut anyway that gets me into all kinds of trouble and it gets me writing books like this one, which is The Darkness Under the Water, set in Waterford in 1930. Um, and when you're a history nut, you also tend to pay attention to your family history. A lot of us know who our parents are and maybe where they grew up, but we don't always think about why they grew up there. My dad, it turns out, was an immigrant, although I never thought of him that way as I was growing up. And my mother was a New Englander. We talked family history of New England endlessly. I grew up in New Jersey, but I knew my mother was from New England, and this was the place you were supposed to be. So as soon as I could, I got myself back here. I arrived with my first child in 1978 and have been in the Northeast Kingdom ever since. But it actually wasn't until this room became uh, explored that I started to realize my family had ties right here to St. Johnsbury. As the ceiling was taken apart to reveal this beautiful painted ceiling underneath, as the, the sconces were rehabilitated on the sides, as Athenaeum Hall emerged from what had been the children's library up here, um, I suddenly found out that one of Grammy's cousins, which in this ca case meant my mother's grandmother's cousin, had actually given a speech here. His name was Russell Conwell, and he was famous for giving a speech called Acres of Diamonds. It was perhaps the most, do you know this speech, Bernie, or by any chance, Acres of Diamonds? It was the speech that justified going out and making yourself wealthy. It said you're going to find your wealth in your own backyard, in your town, in your home, on your farm. But it justified wealth as a very Christian thing to achieve. 
and it explained why you would want to do this and why it would fit with your religious beliefs and how you could go forward and help out in the world because you had achieved some wealth and some prestige in your life. So Russell Conwell, Grammy's cousin, had been here and given a speech and I thought, wow, I belong in St. Johnsbury, <laughs> which is a good feeling when you, when you felt like an immigrant from New Jersey. Um, the next thing that happened was just about the time that the gallery was um, being, when word went out that the gallery would be closed for this year in order to redo the skylights. And that was that I discovered that another of Grammy's cousins on the other side had given a speech in St. John's Ferry, Alice Freeman Palmer. And I started to think, what? How can one person have two relatives who've given speeches here and she never knew it before until she grew up and, and all of these things began happening? Well, that kind of drove me into digging around to find out who else had given speeches here. And when I found people like Frederick Douglass, a black man, Booker T. Washington, the, the poster person for black education, um, Henry Stanley, the explorer who said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, in deepest, darkest Africa, Mrs. General Custer, I said, wow, this is amazing. And, and I came running here to the Athenaeum and I said, listen, if the gallery's gonna close, can we please, please, please celebrate Athenaeum Hall and the people who were here? Now, as it turned out, as Bob and Shara and Lisa and I dug into these things, not every name we had come across definitely spoke in this very room. We know that President Benjamin Harrison did. As you came up those steps, you stepped where President Benjamin Harrison stepped. There used to be a balcony on the building right outside that window, and that's where he spoke and addressed the town. And according to the Caledonian record, 15,000 people were here to hear him talk. Um, this, is, this was just awesome to me. There were a lot of halls around town where people would come and talk. For one thing, most ordinary people didn't get to travel all that much in the late 1800s when the Athenaeum was founded. It opened its doors in November of 1871. Um, the, the most wealthy or prominent people in the town, the Fairbanks family, were very interested in, in having everyone, even the people who ran the machine lathes in the factory, be cultured, be in touch with what was happening in the world. And so they created the Athenaeum. They created St. Johnsbury Academy. They made sure that fine churches were being built. They established the planetarium eventually. And all of this was so that people in St. Johnsbury would get to know the world and the world would come here. Now, why? And we, we asked ourselves this as we did the research. Why did the world want to come here to St. Johnsbury? Well, part of it was this Fairbanks family. They had a lot of clout. They, they not only were wonderful inventors and leaders and cultural leaders, but they also were friends and relatives of the people who led the state, like Governor Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah and Senator Redfield Proctor, who was a good friend of theirs, was very much involved with the Civil War. So if you came to Vermont and you said your piece and you gave a political presentation or you talked about life at its most spiritual or most meaningful, you were talking to the people who made a difference. Just as today, you can actually pick up the phone and call the governor's hotline anytime you want to, leave a message for the governor. And you can call your state senator's office and probably talk with the state senator. You can call Patrick Leahy's office. And although you're not likely to, t to actually talk directly with Senator Leahy, you will definitely talk with someone who then goes and talks with him. Vermont is a small enough place where people's views really matter. So people came here to the Athenaeum and to the other lecture halls around town. There was a YMCA building. There was the Chandler Music Hall. There was the Old Town Hall. There was the, Athen the Academy's New Academy Hall, which seated 1,200 people. Um, these were big gathering places. And people could come here and the places would get full. The, the tickets were charged for. Sometimes you had to sign up ahead of time. You might even have to bid for your tickets. And over and over again, people came here to talk and people from the town and the area around came out in throngs to listen. Now, um, 
that's a little basic background to what was going on. And Bob Jolly has written a great overview of the, the hall, meeting halls of the town. And the two programs that were going on nationally that led people to expect this, one was called the Lyceum Program, and the other was Chautauquas. And some of you will have heard of both of those. Um, St. Johnsbury really developed its own version of this, though, because of the Fairbanks family and because of the political enthusiasm of the town and the hunger for news and for literary figures. Um, the paper was an incredible support of all of this. It was not unusual for the paper to print someone's speech. I have here, and you won't be able to see it too well from your seats, but this is the, the beginning of the article on President Benjamin Harrison's visit to the town. It goes on for about eight pages of the newspaper. Not every local paper was that interested in giving this kind of coverage, but ours was, and that's part of what's behind this. Now, everybody seems to have a packet, great. I'm gonna work from this one also. And things are color-coded. So the white sheet on top is a list of little details about membership libraries. The Athenaeum was a membership library. That is, you, you bought a membership in it and that contributed to being able to have books here. But it also meant that the Athenaeum could broaden its scope and be also an art gallery and a place for talks like these. So look at the first sheet, the purple one. This is on Benjamin Harrison's visit. Grab my glasses here. Um, as I said, the, the Caledonian devoted about eight pages to Benjamin Harrison's visit. Now, I don't know about you, but I had not really heard of Benjamin Harrison before. I mean, there's President Lincoln, there's President Washington, we know what they did, but President Benjamin Harrison, who was he? Well, it turned out he was the guy who, um, in his youth, experienced the first 100-year celebration of the country in 18... 76, right? 1776, 1876. And he looked all around him and he saw the, the colorful patriotic buntings that everybody was hanging up. They didn't routinely hang flags at that point, but they draped all the buildings in red, white, and blue with stars and everything else. And after he had seen this in a lot of places, he said, wouldn't it be awesome if when the centennial is over, all of these flags and buntings, all this wonderful color went into our schoolrooms? So President Benjamin Harrison was the president who decided that every schoolroom should have a flag in it. So when you think about doing the Pledge of Allegiance, think about President Benjamin Harrison. As far as I can tell, that was his only really major contribution to American history, but at least it was something. What I do want to show you, though, on this purple page, if you look about two-thirds of the way down, you see that dark section. And this is actually from the paper. It says, arriving at Undercliff, the presidential procession came to a halt until all the carriages had alighted. Now, Undercliff was the Fairbanks home. It was back that way. It had a golf course. It had pine trees. It had greenhouses. It was this huge spread that eventually got developed when the family lost its money during the Depression. But that was, that was still later to come. And at the time of this, Undercliff was the beautiful mansion that you came to where the Fairbanks family welcomed you to the town. So arriving at Undercliff, the procession came to a halt until all the carriages had alighted when the lines reformed and passed in review before the presidential party. St. Johnsbury band standing one side and furnishing music meanwhile. The decorations in the interior of Undercliff were very artistic and consisted of flags and bunting while there were flags of all nations around the room. The picture of ex-governor Erastus Fairbanks in the library was draped with two silk flags, while in the bay window of the dining room was an old flag made by the ladies of St. Johnsbury when the war, and that would be the Civil War, broke out. Dinner was an elaborate ten-course banquet served by Carter Weber of Boston. Now, the paper actually goes into more detail than this. You can find out who set out fairy lanterns in front of their houses, who draped their entire storefronts with red, white, and blue all the way from the roof to the floor. The, um, this building was draped in buntings, and I believe there's a picture of that, right, Bob? Yep, there's a picture of that right in the exhibit, so you can see it. And it was spectacular. Everybody contributed to decorating the entire town. When the train arrived with the president on it, they actually um, took the carriages 
of people down to the far end of Railroad Street so that they could all line up behind it. And then they went along Railroad Street, up Eastern Avenue, along here, back into what we now call the Four Seasons area with the Spring Street in summer, and around to the, the school so that the children could make a presentation, bring out their flowers, and then finally back to Undercliff, and then after Undercliff to St. Johnsbury House and to here. And, and the presidential speech out front. Now, if you flip your purple page over on the back, and this is kind of the routine I did on everything, on the back you'll find a piece of President Harrison's speech itself. And he's, he's complimenting St. Johnsbury on being sort of the ultimate working class town where everyone is educated and cultured, as we all are now, of course. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to the next one, because I have, quite a few people I want to tell you about, and I want to leave room for some questions also. On the yellow sheet, there, I have three people packed onto this, just because these are people that you probably already know something about, and I didn't feel like I wanted to go through all the detail that I do on the other sheets. The first one is Frederick Douglass. If you need a reminder, Frederick Douglass was a slave who managed to gain his freedom and come up north and begin to talk about what slavery was. And this was at the time quite remarkable because a lot of people still believed that the reason black people were enslaved was because they weren't quite human. And they couldn't really learn and they couldn't read and it hadn't penetrated many people's minds and it was because they weren't allowed to learn it to start with. So when Frederick Douglass arrived in the North, he dressed in a beautiful suit, he had a, a stalk of, of lace at his throat, he had his hair parted and, and combed, and he went around and in the most elegant language possible, he talked about the horrors that he had seen face to face. And it was like nobody could look at Frederick Douglass, nobody could listen to Frederick Douglass and say, black people are animals. Nobody could say this justifies slavery anymore. They had to face the fact that black people had only a difference of skin color from white people. So Frederick Douglass's arrival on the scene was one of the most remarkable things for people who had been very prejudiced before. Um, also very important during that time before the Civil War was the writing of a tiny little woman from New England named Harriet Beecher Stowe. And she wrote what? Yeah, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, came here. He had been an ardent abolitionist before the war, and he, he was really good at public speaking. He was a minister, and he could talk about why women should have the vote, which didn't happen until, hmm, how many years ago now, 85 years ago? Very recent, 90 this year, okay. So very recently, um, he could talk about Darwin's theory of evolution, and he, he was an enemy to all kinds of bigotry, not only racial, but also religious and social. So like Mark Twain, his friend, Henry Ward Beecher found that going around and lecturing in different places felt good to him, felt right, and he could share his ideas. And uh, these lecturers began to sort of migrate together, and a fellow named James Redpath formed a speaker's bureau. So he had Mark Twain, and he could say, okay, Mr. Twain will go to this town, this town, this town, and uh, after him we'll have uh, Mr. Beecher come through. So it, it was almost like a travel agency in a way, and sending these great speakers around New England and the rest of the country. So we had Frederick Douglass, we had Henry Ward Beecher, and on the back of this, um, Booker T. Washington. And again, in each of these passages, the dark material is from something that that person actually wrote and Booker T. Washington was born right as the Civil War was um, starting. He was five years old when the Civil War began. And he became president of the first college that America offered for black people called? Tuskegee. Yes, Tuskegee. Okay, you're a knowledgeable crew. The Fairbanks family would appreciate you. So Booker T. Washington was one of the people who came here too. I think not quite as early in his life as some, as, some of the others because he was a younger man. I've said that backward, but you know what I meant. Okay, we're on the green page, Acres of Diamonds, the multi-million dollar speech by Russell Conwell. Now this is my mother's Grammy's cousin, Russell. And Russell had grown up in Western Massachusetts. He was the son of a relatively poor farming couple, but he enlisted in, in the Civil War and became an officer 
and learn to be a leader of men, and he loved it. And then the Civil War was over, and what was he going to do with these skills? Well, he charged around talking with the men that had, worked, that had fought with him and things like that, and then he began to tell stories about his wartime experiences and things with swords, cavalry swords, and people who were rescued. And eventually, he hit upon this particular speech that he began to give called Acres of Diamonds that talked about a man who searched all over the world for diamonds and gone to Africa and everything else, and eventually he comes home and he finds them in his own backyard. So now we've heard this a little bit in The Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah, I, I want to go home. Uh, whatever you're looking for, you might find it right where you are. Well, this was Russell Conwell's message. And he began to give the speech in various short and long forms. One pa form is 78 pages long. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know I had such long-winded relatives. And um, he would charge for giving the speech. And he gave the speech more than six thousand times. And with all the money he got from that, he found a Temple University in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. So if you flip to the back of that green sheet, you'll find a little piece from his speech. And this is somewhat smaller type, sorry about that, but it's because I wanted to give you some more of his argument about why it's so important to, as a Christian for him, it, this was his justification for why a Christian should have money. Uh, the reason that was significant was there's a lot of talk within Christian sermons about giving away all you have, about living poor and sharing everything. And Russell Conwell was saying, no, nah, no, nah, what you want to do is get out there and, and earn lots of money, and then you can do good things with it. But you don't have to be poor to be a good Christian. Up this point. Yeah. Now, it might have been just a little self-serving, but no. <laughs> Okay, the next sheet after Russell Conwell. This is pretty exciting stuff. Horace Greeley and Thomas Nast. Now, most of you probably will have heard of neither one. But if you're a newspaper or history fan, you might have heard of Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley was the man who, starting with an apprenticeship in a print shop in Vermont, which is the place where lots of powerful people seem to start out, um, worked his way down to New York City and founded a newspaper. And his first newspaper was sort of like a Reader's Digest. He cut little bits from everybody else's paper and put them together and sold it. Brilliant. And then he acquired two or three more papers and eventually put them together in some something called the Tribune. And if you're as old as I am or older, you may remember the Herald Tribune, which was still being published in the 1960s when I was a kid, 50s and 60s. So Horace Greeley was a, a force to be reckoned with in the newspaper world, and he became what we would see as the first real editorial or op-ed writer for America. He got involved in political campaigns, he went out there after slavery, he talked about abolition, and he, he really pushed the government along. And when the Civil War came, he was the one who fought with Lincoln. Lincoln said to him, I'm not necessarily in this war in terms of slavery. I know slavery is wrong, but I'm in this war to hold the Union together. And Horace Greeley said, you're wrong, man. You have to make a statement. You have to take a stand on abolition. You have to do it. And on the back of the Horace Greeley sheet, you'll actually find um, the president's response to Horace Greeley. <laughs> So the president and Horace Greeley were arguing about this. And as we know in hindsight, Horace Greeley was absolutely right. The war could not be won until the president took that stand and made this civil war that was tearing the country apart, made it a moral war as well as a political war. And that seemed to be what was necessary to carry the war the rest of the way through. Many Vermont men had signed up for the sake of the Union, very few knew enough about slavery at the time, about the horrors of one man trying to own another man, about the, the dreadful things that were being done in the South, to jump into the war for the sake of people they'd never met. But they would go in for the Union. By the end of the war, that had changed. Vermont had become an ardently abolition state. But Horace Greeley had gotten a little softer on things. He was older, he had mellowed a little bit, and when the leader of the Confederacy, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was thrown into jail at the end of the Civil War, Horace Greeley said, isn't that a little harsh? I mean, he was a leader of his part of the country. Uh, let's all gather up some money and bail him out. Well, a lot of people didn't care for that. And one of them was Thomas Nast. 
Nast, while Horace Greeley was becoming an editorial writer, Nast was developing editorial cartoons for papers. And Nast began to fry Horace Greeley in his cartoons. He had him as dressed as a slave owner himself. He poo-pooed Horace Greeley's original stance for abolition. He tore him apart on a daily basis. Every single day, a cartoon would come out under Thomas Nast's pen. Well, this was a rough thing for Horace Greeley because he had decided to run against the hero of the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant, for the presidency. And every day, you'd open your paper, and there would be another cartoon lambasting him, even as he was trying to tour. For sure, he came to St. Johnsbury as part of his campaign tour in the year. Ah, sometimes I can get the years, and sometimes I don't. Where are we? We are 18, 18, 72, thank you. Okay, so here comes Horace Greeley through town and he makes his speech and every day that he's here, there's another cartoon coming out. And he gets all the way to the election and those cartoons were powerful. They were at least as powerful as the editorials. They were convincing to people, they were humiliating of Greeley and he went down to a stunning defeat. And within a week after that defeat, he was terribly, terribly ill. He had a complete mental collapse. And by December, the election was in November, by December he was dead. Yeah, there's the power of the press. So this battle of Horace Greeley and Thomas Mass took place here in St. Johnsbury because they each came through, not at the same date. And you have on the back of your sheet, again, you have President Lincoln's justification letter saying he wasn't going to do the, the, the stance against abolition yet. Thank goodness he did. The pink sheet, um, Alice Freeman Palmer. I'm not going to talk a lot about Alice Freeman Palmer. She was my other relative who was here. Um, what's fun about her is she became a college president at age 27. She became the first woman to head a nationally known college in the US. First, um, she got a, an honorary PhD from the University of Michigan and she became president of Wellesley College. And in those days, and even when I was first a little girl, if you were pregnant and you were a teacher, you were expected to resign. Pregnancy was not considered appropriate in the classroom. And in fact, in Alice Freeman Palmer's days at Wellesley College, Neither was marriage. Wellesley College was for women who were strong and getting educated and going out there on their own, and they needed single women leadership. So when Alice Freeman fell in love with George Herbert Palmer from the uh, Boston area, she had to keep her romance secret. When he asked her to marry him and they became engaged, they had to keep that secret. And when she finally divulged to the trustees of the college what she had done, fallen in love, gotten engaged, they were appalled. And they gave her a certain number of months and she had to be gone. But she went on from there, she continued to work for women even though she was married, poor thing. And um, she founded some of the great women's organizations like the American Academy of, American Association of University Women. And continued to be a lobbyist. She died fairly young. She never had a good chest, that sort of New England thing. but. But she was nifty and she was here and she was invited by the women's club. And I can picture them now, you know, having tea together. And my experience of women's clubs, even fairly recently, is that the best China comes out for the women's club meetings. I can picture them having tea together and saying, wouldn't it be nice if Alice Freeman Palmer herself were here to tell us about how women should get educated? So on the back of the pink sheet, you'll find Alice Freeman Palmer's reasoning for why women should go to college. It sounds strange now, but there was a time when people were absolutely convinced if you went to college, you would be ruined and you would never get a husband ever. All right. The sheet after Alice is on a sort of a cream yellow, and it's Henry M. Stanley, Henry Morton Stanley. Henry Stanley was a newspaperman, and he was given a chance to go and he was assigned by the publisher of the New York Herald to go to Africa and track down a missing missionary. Everybody had been asking, what has happened to David Livingstone? 
He'd been a very well-known missionary. He'd gone off to deepest, darkest Africa in the jungle. And remember, this is a time when the mythology of um, different places was still very powerful for Americans. The Civil War had been fought, abolition had been won, but people still felt as though if you looked different or you spoke a different language, you might be threatening, you might be very strange. And Africa was mythologized as this deep, dark, mysterious, and mystical place. And David Livingstone was lost there. So Stanley traveled to Zanzibar, put together an expedition. And his instructions from his editor, he, he said to the editor, well, how much money do I get to spend on doing this? And the editor said, here's $1,000 to start with. When you finish that, send me a telegram, I'll send you another $1,000. When you finish that, send me a telegram, I'll send you another $1,000, as much as it takes. And, and he spent thousands. He put together this huge expedition, 200 people to carry all the, all the luggage and, and people on horses, and he was on a horse, and off they rode to big news into the jungle. Well, can you imagine what happens to horses in the jungle? I think it was within two weeks, all the horses were dead. Everybody had to carry everything for themselves. According to the dispatches that Henry sent back to the newspapers, he was whipping and screaming and shouting at the carriers and making them carry everything. And that probably was exaggerated. It turns out, as we look back at history, that that was what Victorians expected. But it seems very unlikely in hindsight now that Henry actually whipped anybody or, or did more than throw his cane at somebody or something like that. But that was the kind of thing he was sending back to the newspapers. And this became like, Oh, gee, like the, when the people were captured in Germany and there were hostage negotiations and every day you read something more on it. Or after 9-11, you're trying to figure out where the bombs are struck and every day you'd read something more on it. So people were reading every day something more on Henry Morton Stanley. And the, the line that most of us, if we do know about Henry Stanley, the line that we all quote is, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, which supposedly was what Stanley said when he eventually did find the mission, missionary in deepest, darkest Africa. That, that little bit of cultured European style or upper class American style as it happened at the time. It's probable that that too was a fraud. The reason we suspect now that it was a fraud is Henry Morton Stanley's diaries do exist, but the page where he met Dr. Livingstone is torn out and gone. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the fun of, of history today is we're always finding out something new. We're always learning that we were looking at something with a perspective from our, our own time that can be challenged as time goes on. So you have a little bit on the front of the page in dark type from the Caledonian record. And the Caledonian record comments in a rather snippy way on Henry Morton Stanley's visit to the town because everyone expected him to look like this travel-worn explorer in his you know, fatigues or whatever and, and sweat stain. Well, he arrived in a very fancy silk suit with his hands all glittering with diamonds. So I guess he had done very well from his newspaper work, but the town was a little bit shocked. On the back of the page, you have a, a piece from Stanley's text of how I found Livingstone, probably um, pretty close to a fictionalized memoir. All right, next page is an orange sheet, and that's Lou Wallace, the author of Ben-Hur. Now, if you are under age 60, you might not even have realized that Ben-Hur was a book before it was a movie. If you have seen anything from Ben-Hur, you may have seen it in black and white on the television, and you've seen chariot races. Well, Lou Wallace, as it turns out, was another army officer. And I started to get this picture of all these guys who'd gone to war, and you know, a lot of them died, and a lot of them were crippled by their injuries. But the ones who survived came back in peacetime, and they had all these great skills of leadership and foresight and planning and how to put together a campaign and no place to use them. So some of them became political leaders, but many others were really frustrated and trying to figure out what to do next. Lou, actually, you would think he would have been better off in peacetime because his civil war was pretty discouraging. At the Battle of Shiloh, Grant gave him an, a place that he was supposed to be with the forces he was leading. 
And apparently he took the wrong road to get there, a road that took three hours longer than Grant expected. And the battle caused the Union forces to be defeated. And everybody said, it's Lew Wallace's fault. Well, according to records after the fact, Grant probably didn't even know there were two routes, so he didn't have the sense to specify. If he did know, he gave the wrong directions. It probably wasn't Lew Wallace's fault, but he wasn't on top, Grant was. So he took the blame for it, his commission was removed for him, he was bitterly ashamed. And the war kept on going, he worked his way back up again in, 19, in 1864, he was commanding another big group of men, and he gets instructions once again to have them at a particular place for the defense of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And he ends up fighting this huge campaign against the Confederates who are charging at him, and it takes him twice as long as expected to get to D.C., and the city, uh, the, the battle that day is lost. And who gets blamed? Lou. Again, probably wasn't his fault, but again, his commission was removed, and eventually it was restored to him, but he felt so bitterly ashamed for this. So when we get to the end of the war, he settles into Texas for a while, New Mexico. He becomes the negotiator with the famous outlaw, Billy the Kid, but it's never quite enough to remove this internal emotional burden he's carrying about how everybody has blamed, for, blamed him for things that went on in the war and how humiliated and embarrassed he feels. So he begins to write a book. And the book he writes is subtitled, and most people don't know this about Ben-Hur, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. He sort of pictured himself as being the sacrificial lamb for the war, much as Christ was the great sacrifice. So he created a character, and here we go back to um, bigotry and, and people's images of what difference was. He decided that a Jewish man would be converted by meeting the Christ, and they would race in a chariot race, and this would show how powerful Christianity was, and it would ransom this poor Jewish man from the shame and humiliation he had of being the wrong religion. Well. You can see a little bit of Lou coming through in there, right? Yeah, just a little bit. The book was a huge hit. When he came to St. Johnsbury, I'm sure he expected to be known as the author of the book, and he was here to, you know. Yep. Unfortunately, St. Johnsbury welcomed him as a soldier instead. So he had to go through the whole thing all over again. People wanted to know about the battles and how come he'd made those mistakes. And uh, it was tough. It was tough. But. Um, he did come here, he did visit, he did share his book, and there's a copy of it here. Um, Bob and I each found a copy of fairly early editions, and the copy that's here is really nifty. Do take a look at it. And I should have said, Bob found a great copy of Henry Morton Stanley's book, too, Into Darkest Africa. So um, Lou gets here, he has this rather disappointing me meeting with the town, and on the back of his page, uh, I've given you something a little bit different. Uh, it's a, it's a section from Ben-Hur, it's the race, and it describes the chariot race. Well, the reason I've put that there is that chariot race became something magnificent in filmmaking. We were just sort of moving into the great era of filmmaking as Ben-Hur was brought to the movies. And the first film for Ben-Hur was something of a failure financially. The second one, though, brought in all the great movie stars of the time. And any star who wasn't in it came to see the filming as well. So there were huge crowds around it. And the, um, the producers and directors of the film decided that in order to make the chariot race really real, they needed to have the charioteers, the guys driving the horses, compete seriously for this. So they brought in real horses, real chariots, real drivers, and they offered a big money prize. Well, sure enough, the guys driving the chariots got out there in front of the film cameras. They forgot about the cameras entirely. They started racing. They cut each other off. They crashed into each other. The horses were screaming, having been knocked over and their legs broken. And men were wounded as well, but it was the horses that the film cameras caught, the horses in their terror and their pain. And that launched the powerful era of the ASPCA the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So many people saw this film and were horrified by what happened to the horses. Okay. Next page, Mrs. General Custer. All right, this is the one where Bob and I both had the most fun. Bob, did everybody see Bob? Do you know who he is? He's right back there in the white shirt. 
Um, you've probably heard of General Custer. Custer's last stand, the Battle of Little Bighorn. It was a really embarrassing battle of white settlers from the East Coast and, and from the Midwest against Native Americans. Um, and it happened at a time when the leaders, the greatest leaders of the Native American tribes out West were actually willing finally to negotiate, to have a treaty, to have a truce, to settle things down. But Custer was out there and Custer wanted to fight. Now, Custer as an army officer was something of a problem. He had been a Civil War officer and gotten out fairly early. The war ended before he'd been able to come up with a lot of glory. He was able to get um, promoted just a little ways before the end of the war, which was a good thing for him because the, the girl whose hand he was seeking in Michigan, um, her father was definitely a snob and he wasn't going to have his daughter marry just any old army officer. He had great pride in his background and this girl's grandfather, by the way, was a page from Rutland, Vermont. The family was well known on both sides, the Bacons, the Clifts, the Pages, and it wasn't until Custer became a brevet colonel, I think is the rank, and you'll find it written in here, um, that Libby's father finally agreed that she could get engaged to and marry this Civil War officer. But, of course, he wanted more to do. And I've said that one of the things that was happening at the time that the Athenaeum opened, 1871, the Civil War ended in 65. So this is a six-year gap in here. What's happened is you have all these strong, powerful, energetic young men who have had success on the battlefield, who are really charged up about themselves as leaders and who have nothing to lead. So many of them did what, what Custer did, which is he went out west for the Indian Wars. And he managed to get himself a leadership slot, but his men were worried about him from the first day. You see, Custer really wanted to see a buffalo. So he got up on his horse and he rode out among all those grassy hills that all looked the same, without a compass, without a map, without telling anybody where he was going. Rode his horse until he found a big black buffalo. Urged his horse closer and closer to the animal, which finally picked its head up and stared at the horse. And the horse went, holy cow, flipped him off and ran. Horse had a lot more sense than Custer did. And there's Custer standing out there in the grass with a buffalo in front of him. And he's, you know, you can just sort of picture him looking around saying, um, um. He had no clue where to go to get back. Of course, they had to go out and search for him. And he made decision after decision like this. So when it came to his turn to actually fight in the Indian Wars, he made the same kind of dumb decisions. He marched out there when truce talks were going on. He tackled a force he had no business tackling, and his men were brutally defeated. And since he died in it, it was very easy to blame him for all the failures going on, probably 90% of which he deserved. Well, you remember that pretty girl whose hand he had won in Michigan? Little Libby with his, her grandfather in Vermont? Libby was used to being the most beautiful, the most wealthy, the most attractive woman around. She had actually gone out west with her husband, unlike many of the other military wives, because she wanted to see the action. And she had her, you know, all, all different changes of clothes and shoes. And she actually went with Custer into the teepees of chieftains and wrote about the, the, how, how frightening it was to go in there, but how important it was that she support her husband in this way. Now, we can see that Libby wasn't a very good military wife also from the fact that at one point she made for her husband, in order to support his prestige, a set of beautiful bright red shirts. Every time he wore them, he got fired at. <laughs> Very embarrassing for Libby and her husband. But she was writing these dispatches back and talking about going into teepees and talking about what it was like to, to meet a squaw, which was a term at that time for a woman of, in, of Native American descent. And it is now considered in some areas to be a derogatory term, so I don't recommend that you use it. Ask someone whether they want that term used or not. But um, this was what Libby was writing about. And when her husband died and began to be blamed for the failures of the Indian Wars, Libby was horrified. She was more than horrified. She was furious. She went up to West Point, where they were putting up a statue that made fun of her husband. And she challenged the West Point leaders, and she made them take it down and correct it. 
She began to write books about her experiences. She wrote three books explaining how wonderful her husband was, the magnificent things he had done out west. She toured the United States. She got into James Redpath's lecture bureau. She got paid for every speech she gave. She, went, she managed so successfully that when she did retire from this, she was the wealthiest widow in New York for a while. And all the way till age 91, she was able to live in grand splendor as a, a widow who had earned her own way from her lectures and her books. Well, Libby just wasn't going to let her husband be blamed. So she re-explained everything that had happened. She re-explained it so vociferously, so successfully, that she screwed up all the history of Custer's last stand in the Battle of Little Bighorn. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that historiography began to sort this out. And the Athenaeum now has a wonderful book that just came out from Nathaniel Philbrick called it's a black book, and, and Bob and I will both remember what it's called later on. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a great book, and it begins to sort it out. But, but this little woman who was so determined to salvage her husband's reputation and, incidentally, her own, um, was able to change all of the way history was being written at the time. She didn't just change history. She also changed literature. One of the great writers of that time was Robert Louis Stevenson, and he wrote... Uh, um, not Robinson Crusoe, I think. Try again. Which one? Mm -hmm. And good. And okay. And what most people know, Treasure Island, kidnapped. Okay. So Robert Louis Stevenson was the heroic writer of the time, and. He, too, was on the tour, and he and Libby met in upstate New York, just across Lake Champlain. And Libby marched right up to him and said, Mr. Stevenson, you're such a great author and all that. Why don't you have any strong, wonderful women in your books? And he said to her, well, you know, I'm married. <laughs> and she said, that's no excuse. And she spent the rest of their time together, which I think was three or four days, just sort of battering at him as relentlessly as her campaign for her husband's reputation had been. And we see Robert Louis Stevenson then go back and write his next book, which was David Balfour, in which he finally writes a strong woman character. Okay. So on the back of Libby's green page, you'll find a piece of her writing from when she talks about um, going into, go, going with the general. And I think there's something about the red shirts here too. So these are the kind of people who were coming here. Here! I mean, Libby Custer's skirts probably crossed the floor, right where your feet are right now. Um, Benjamin Harrison certainly looked from that window as he was getting ready to march out onto the balcony. Frederick Douglass pondered what had become of the abolition movement of the war and looked at the horrors of reconstruction as they were happening in the South. There were many more of these, and, and Bob has listed many of them in the exhibits for you, but we've given you pictures of all of these that I've just talked about. And their photographs are there. Photographs of the Athenaeum from that period are there. Um, and as Lisa and I began to talk about this also and reflect on this after we had put this work together, we said, you know, you know those first Wednesdays that we have at the Athenaeum today? This was the beginning of it. This was the beginning in 1871 of people coming right here to St. Johnsbury to say the important things, to give what they had come up with with the wisdom and experience of their lives, and to ask for their audience to support them, to, to invite questions, to shape their time. This is an important place to be living. And as I said earlier, even today, we in St. Johnsbury have a very easy reach to the leaders of our state. And our state, because we have as many senators as any other state, big or small, our state has an easy reach to the leadership of the nation. And that gives us a chance to help shape the history in front of us. So can I have any questions or comments? Is there any evidence that Robert Louis Stevenson was here in the afternoon? There's not. 
I suspect that he, if he came through the area at all, he came in the Chautauquas, and that would have been in Lindenville. He came as a friend of Henry Playard. Yes, yes. And on yes. Main Street, but visited his home on Main Street. Right, the day of his birthday or right, he did. Yeah, but to speak. Yeah, to speak, I think it probably would have been in Lindenville if he'd been speaking, because he's not listed among the speakers in St. Johnsbury. Another one missing from the list is Mark Twain. And I did check where his speeches were being given, and it looks like he didn't come uh, further north than Bennington, but he did speak in Bennington. I wish he'd spoken here. What's your main source for Caledonian? The Caledonian was a wonderful source. So were, though, the... Um, the history of, of the uh, Fairbanks family, and also the minutes from the library associations, which often met here and would comment on who had been in town and who had come to speak for them, and some of the teachers' minutes. And we found that the minute that you go on the internet and start looking up St. Johnsbury from the 1800s, you're deluged with material. Now, I know there's a, a class here, and we give the the historian's warning about Wikipedia, which is you can find something on Wikipedia, but it's not necessarily true. So the wonderful thing about Wikipedia, though, is it will give you at the end of its articles five or six or even 20 places to then look for the original material. And we kept looking for original material on the people who'd been here. So we found um, five or six different memoirs, for instance, on Russell Conwell, people who had fought with him or people who had worshipped his founding of a university and his tours and who would talk about him. Bonnie. My first day in St. Johnsbury was July 15, 1941. So I was the regional librarian and the librarians from the Northeast Kingdom were having a meeting during the day and in the evening there was a speaker in Athenaeum Hall <laughs> and of course it was like this, before the long before the ceiling was lowered, although I cannot remember thistles. But the speaker was the governor's wife. I can't remember what she spoke about. And I can't remember that there was another meeting like that that I remember. That's wonderful. However, this built, this room was used by the women's club for many years. There was a stage up at the up front, and the women's club had a piano here, and uh, also children of um, my generation would come up here to take piano lessons. Great. Yeah. Now that answers in part a question we had. The women's club list of speakers is in the Fairbanks History of St. Johnsbury. And we were not sure whether the speakers had been here or elsewhere. But it sounds as though many of the speakers might have been here. There was a women's club building on Cherry Street at one point. And I, I found a photograph of that. Well, I, I was sitting, I was proud of that, which you are. And the stage was up there. That's great. And the place was full, and not a ball. Now, I have a sort of an unrelated question, which is, did the women's clubs do bandages for the wars? If you arrived in 41, you were here for the Second World War. Wow. All right, if anybody is looking for a project, this is Eleanor Bonnie Simons, and she is what we call in history a primary source. Because if you ask her about 1941, she's telling you what she experienced. She's not telling you what someone wrote to her. She's not saying what someone commented on. And I would love to, see, to hear more of those memories and to be able to read more of your memories, Bonnie. The North Star, uh, this next, uh, the October issue of the North Star is going to have a, a nice story on Bonnie Simons, who also drove the bookmobile uh, in those days from Canaan to Newbury and all the back roads. You can imagine what that road was like. <laughs> so look forward to reading our local yeah. stuff. Isn't that Bonnie? Right. Is that right? Yes. Yes. October North Star. Great. Bernier? 
father was Bonnie's partner in the book wagon. <laughs> Great. Great. Did your father keep a diary by any chance? No. <laughs> All right. We're always looking for these. Yes. Beth, I think this is a terrific project, and uh, I'm glad you've taken it up. And I hope it gets spread further than this group. I had a couple of comments about what you said about the civil wars that I don't quite agree with. Um, I'd be interested to know how, how uh, Douglas was received here in the 1870s, since in other parts of Vermont, before the Civil War, he was not received well. Secondly, you said that most of the soldiers from Vermont went to support the Union. Mm -hmm. Well, the anti-slavery movement was very strong in the state. It was. So many of them did go for other reasons. The anti-slavery movement was strong, but there was, and, and we can keep talking about this, and I love to talk about this kind of thing. I'm, I've just finished, uh, well, earlier this year, finished a novel set in 1850 in St. Johnsbury. And what I'm finding is that within the anti-slavery movement, there were a number of factions, including some very strong factions that said the way to solve this is to send everyone of color back to Africa where they can be free in their own land. And the Fairbanks family were subscribers to that point of view. So it, what we find is around leaders of churches in particular, there's a lot of abolition feeling. And among women also, there was a lot of abolition feeling. But among men, my sense at this point is that there were very mixed feelings. And many of the documents that we come across, including one that's cited in the Barnett history, um, men will say, I'm going for the union. So by all means, let's keep on doing the research. Let's get out as much primary material as we can. Um, Lynn, put your hand up. Lynn is a historian who works from diaries and letters. So if you run across diaries and letters from that period in particular, let Lynn know she's working on a bi biography right now of women's journals from the 18. Peter, are you writing? Yeah, but uh, I'd like to also publicize that yeah. Michelle Sherburn is getting a talk at the Rygate Historical Society on October 13th on the anti slavery movement before the Civil War in Vermont and the Underground Railroad. So the third thing I want to bring up is you mentioned that uh, Horace Greeley ran against Ulysses Grant. Yes. Now, he was running against the rock star of the 19th century. His chance of winning was very low. So, although Nash may have had an impact on him, I think he didn't really have a chance. That, that would be another good one to keep wrestling with. And, and this, is, this is the excitement of real history, is that it is a wrestling. It is a digging out of evidence. It's, it's almost uh, like a law and order playing out right here. It's, it's digging for the documents that got hidden and the people who said things and the people who changed things. Oh. All right. Yes, and um, I won't go into that in long detail right now because I promised I'd try to wrap at eight for the class who's here, and I think that's just about what it is. But if you haven't seen it yet, in Barnett's library, there is a leather-bound volume of, it was called the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the movement that was fighting alcohol that led into being also the suffrage movement. And it's their minutes. And it is signed on the flyleaf by Susan B. Anthony, the great leader of the suffrage movement. It's right down the road in Barnett. So you're welcome, and thanks for asking. I'm going to wrap up. Uh, Dave does have, Dave, put your hand up. That's my husband Dave back there. Dave has some copies of The Darkness Under the Water in case anybody wasn't able to find one earlier and they're signed and ready for you.